Um, morning. I'm here to talk about cache assisted secure execution on ARM devices. Okay, um, this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to start with um, why did we start this project and then look into um, the threat model, who are we defending against. Uh, then we show a little bit of animation about how it works and then give you a little bit taste of what are the implementation details that we face when we implement our system, uh, followed by the, uh, followed by the uh, evaluation and conclusion. So um, mobile malware is on the rising. This is not a news for everybody. Internet of Things, many people joke about it and say it's Internet of Insecure Things. Um, so with all the malware out there, some of the malware actually make it to the kernel and achieve arbitrary code execution in the kernel. So ARM is one of the most biggest um, embedded processors that's powering more than 60% uh, of the embedded devices. They introduced something called a trust zone, uh, which was talked about a lot in the previous couple of talks. Um, so trust zone provide a system-wide protection that delivers uh, partition between resources. Uh, the the non-trusted resources runs the content-rich environment. Um, for example, uh, running your Angry Bird in the normal world, and then the trusted domain runs your security services such as AES encryption. Um, and this protection, what's different than some of the previous TEE is that it provides a system-wide protection that spans across processor, memory, and IO devices. Uh, as we can see later, it actually modifies the cache, in, the cache architecture as well. So there are many products out there that use um, trust zone devices, uh, um, trust zone services, such as uh, Samsung Knox, uh, Trustonix, Sierraware, uh, Qualcomm, and Qualcomm actually sp spur a little bit news on uh, in Black Hat where people start looking into the vulnerabilities inside. So besides the software side, right, if we think about the physical system, um, sometimes your smartphones actually go a lot more mobile than you wish to. For example, when you're just reading the phone, um, it could get snatched on the, in the train or something, and then you lose physical possession of your phone. So how does this translate to security? Um, actually, once you lose the physical possession of your phone, there's, uh, the attacker can do a lot more than just software attacks. Uh, they can launch something called the co-boot attack, which is probably not a new topic for everyone here. Uh, it relies, it exploits the physical memory remnants feature of the memory. Um, contrary to popular belief where you think if you turn off the power of a computer, um, the memory contents are gone, uh, that's not true, especially when you freeze the RAM. So initially, this, this attack was uh, published and launched on the desktops where they can recover uh, memory uh, encryption keys inside the RAM. It was later demonstrated on those mobile phones as well. Therefore, the threat of, uh, of co-boot when you lose physical possession of the phone is real. Recognizing the threat, there has been multiple um, defenses that were proposed uh, on how to fix this type of co-boot uh, attacks where uh, the significance of co-boot attack is uh, despite the software protection attacker, as long as they get, they get their hands on your mobile devices, they can read all the memory. So uh, most of the defense focuses on how do we do things without the involvement of memory. Uh, therefore, the first one is on the random encryption on AES, followed by uh, a series of works on using, either using coprocessors or using uh, cache registers to achieve encryptions. Um, However, none of this work actually uh, look at multi-vector attackers where you launch both software attacks and hardware attacks, which would be if, um, for example, if you are a government state trying to crack a phone or you are some really persistent uh, attackers who really want the contents on the phone, then you want to pay the price of using both uh, hardware attacks and malware exploits to get to the mobile phone. Um, so the goal of our, uh, our, our system is to defend against such uh, multi-vector adversaries. In particularly, we want to defend against two types of attackers. 
uh, the first type of attacker is the physical memory disclosure attack, well, which is the COBOT attack, where you gain unrestricted read access to the memory. And the second one is uh, we assume an attacker can exploit the OS through some vulnerabilities. So uh, they can get control to the page table and things like that. And the design goal of our system is to provide confidentiality and integrity to both code and data segments of the binary, as well as the runtime data. So the incentive for confidentiality is that uh, if there are some intellectual properties, uh, secret codes, sensitive data that you store in the uh, data segment of the code, uh, you really want to protect it such that other people will find it hard to do reverse engineering on it. Uh, the integrity part is we want to verify that we have the correct program behavior. So this is our threat model. Um, it's a simplified view of the program hierarchy in the ARM processors. Uh, here I oversimplify a little bit where we only have processor cache and the memory. Um, as I talked about in the very beginning, uh, resources in ARM devices are divided into the secure and the non-secure. In the memory, you basically assign a segment to the secure word and you assign a segment to the non-secure word. Um, however, in the cache of ARM devices, it's a little bit different where allocations are not fixed. Um, they add an additional bit uh, called NS bit into the cache lines such that each cache line can either be secure or non-secure. So uh, what's the capability of the attacker in this type of model? Co-boot attack can read, all, can, gain, can read all the physical memory. Therefore, it can read both the secure memory and the non-secure memory. The software attacker, on the other hand, uh, compromises the normal, uh, normal word-rich OS kernel. Therefore, they get unlimited read access to the normal word memory. And also, they get access to the uh, processor cache of the non-secure cache as well, because they can choose the CPU. So sounds like the only place without attacker is the secure cache. And um, I feel like that's the haven. So um, I'm putting my system in there. Uh, so here we go into uh, an overview of how the system works. Uh, we have we designed two execution uh, modes. One is secure mode. The other one is uh, normal, uh, non-secure mode. In secure mode, we use the secure, the secure cache as the execution environment uh, memory. And in non-secure mode, we use the non-secure cache. There are actually all pros and cons that we we'll discuss further details in the paper. Um, but let's go into the how secure mode works. So uh, applications are encrypted in memory. And then when they need to be executed, they, they get loaded into the cache. The key is uh, loaded from the secure storage. And when the application binary is loaded into cache, uh, so is the application context. Because when you consider the ex execution of a program, it includes the data segment, the code segment, also the stacks, heaps, and other uh, application context environment, which we want to store all inside the cache, such that we can protect the entire application and the execution. So the application is then decrypted. Um, once it's decrypted, uh, we can direct our control flow inside the uh, code that's loaded entirely inside the cache. So, when, but however, when we need, there's always task switching between uh, in the operating system. When there's a task switch, for example, when we need to start playing our MP3 uh, music, there's, it's not necessary to erase the entire thing. We can just leave them in the secure cache because the inherent protection of trust zone, where as long as it's marked as secure, the normal word, or the compromised normal word, uh, rich OS cannot touch it. However, things can be a little bit more difficult when you try to use the normal word cache. Um, the incentive for us to use normal word cache is because if we place everything in secure cache, 
yes, we have less overheads during the test switch. However, that, that also implies if we have a vulnerability inside the, um, the code itself, which is nowadays it's hard to guarantee that codes are free of vulnerabilities, then um, our trust zone is on too. And when, when we lose control of our trust zone, uh, we, it becomes impossible to talk about the security. So uh, with the, using the normal work cache, we can sort of contain our program such that um, when there's damage, it's limited. Again, the applications are encrypted in the uh, normal world memory. And just to remind you, the, the RAM there means uh, the attacker has read access to both the normal world memory and the secure world memory. And the malicious hat means that they have control of the end. Uh, the attacker also has the control over the entire normal world memory. So the first step we did is uh, pause the normal world OS because if we are going to use the normal world um, cache uh, and the uh, normal world OS has access to the cache, then we are fighting a battle with, with doubt results. So we pause that OS and then we load the application into the, uh, the, secure, uh, the, the normal cache and then we generate the context just like we did in the secure world. And then the case manager needs to verify um, the execution environment of the secure world. Inside this verification, why it's different than the uh, uh, secure cache execution mode is because if you think about it, most of the modern cache use um, uh, PIPT, physically indexed, physically tagged caches. However, the processor actually runs in virtual memory mode. So there's, there's this translation from the virtual address uh, to the physical address, then map to the cache. And if you just verify ca contents in the cache, it's not enough because attacker can just redirect the, your, your virtual pointer to a different place. So we also verify the TLBs and things like that. And uh, the details are in the, the, the devils are in the paper. So similar to the secure world, we load a key and we unpack the applications. Once it's unpacked, uh, we can start executing, do all sorts of stuff, for example, decryption, encryption, kernel checks. Uh, once it's done, when we need to switch other type of tasks, uh, the application context need to be safe because uh, the normal cache is accessible by the uh, adversaries. So we encrypt the content using the packer again and save the encrypted content in the memory. And because code attack only has read access to the memory, it cannot tamper with our encrypted contacts. So now I go give you a little bit, two, two details in my implementation. Uh, the first detail is uh, controlling the cache. So cache is designed to be a transient feature in processors where you're supposed to be just use it as a black magic. Uh, how do we control it? We use the um, cache lockdown registers. So in ARM, in order to and give some specific and uh, performance enhancement capability to designers. They introduce something called the cache lockdown, such that if you know a cache is going to be frequently used, you can lock that down uh, in order to avoid cache pollutions. Uh, the granularity of the locking in our, in our uh, processor, uh, the Cortex A8, is per cache way, and there are eight cache ways of a total size 256 KB. Uh, of L2 unified cache in Cortex A8. So we can either lock the caches 32 KB, 64 KB, 96 KB. So how do we lock the cache, right? Uh, the first step is we disable the local RQs. We make sure nobody can bother us. Um, the second step is we uh, enable the caching in the, of the memory area. Um, and then we disable the caching of loader code and loader stack. The reason why we need to disable that is if we enable the caching of the loader code and stack, when we, load, when we try to load the memory, uh, a lot the other values that are associated with the loader pro program will also be loaded into cache. And we really don't want to lock that particular loader code in the cache instead of our stuff, like the, the program execution space of the application that we want to protect. Once we, uh, once we disable the uh, caching on those loader codes, uh, we invalidate the uh, caching for the memory area that we want to load. 
Um, so why did we do that? Uh, the reason we did that is because uh, in, in many of our computer architectures, such as ARM, uh, you don't have a notion, you have multiple levels of cache first, first of all. So you have L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache. And our caching uh, locking is only enabled on the L2 cache. Therefore, if the memory area was previously filled in the L1 cache, and we locked the L2 cache, we end up not locking the cache at all. That's why we want to invalidate it. And then when we load it in, it would be automatically filled into both L1 and L2 due to the cache filling process inside the processor. Um, and then we basically, we toggle the switch and say all the cache go to the designated way of locking for us. Uh, once we do that, we uh, iteratively load, load the memory, causing cache fields on the memory area. Once the memory area is all filled in the cache, in other words, there's a cache line for each memory address that uh, we're going to use for the application space, uh, we lock the cache. So that's one of the implementation details we did. The second challenge that we find interesting is um, handling self-modifying programs. Uh, if you recall that we decrypt our application entirely in cache, so it's an in-place decryption. Uh, on on uh, modern computer caches, you have uh, separated L1 data and L1 uh, instruction, right? So, for example, when they, they are both loaded as encrypted in the cache in the L1 cache, when it's decrypted, uh, the the decrypted value is actually stored in the L1 data. So now we have a mismatching between the instruction and data. And if you're lucky like me, you're going to see this screen, which tells you the kernel has died and you need to reboot the processor board. Uh, so the common way of fixing this is you would flush everything to, cat, everything to memory and then just let the synchronization does its job. However, in our use case, uh, flushing to memory is it's not possible because we want we don't want to flush our uh, secret contents to the to the memory. We want everything in, to be inside the cache. So again, we have the encrypted data. Uh, once it's decrypted, instead of saving it in L1, uh, we erase everything in L1 and and write it direct to, directly to L2, which is a unified cache. Because it's a unified cache, we don't have to deal with the incoherency between the data cache and instruction cache. And the way we, we write into L, L2 unified cache is by um, using the L2 write allocation feature that are common across many ARM processors. Okay, so now we get to the evaluation part. Um, so one of the questions I ask myself is, okay, I'm gonna put everything in cache, a decrypted application in cache. What type of application can I fit in the tiny, teeny cache, right? Um, so, uh, we, so we implement two uh, applications using our framework. One is the kernel integrity check. The other one is a, a suite of kernel, uh, a suite of cryptographic functions. So, as you can see in the uh, in the table, the, the the cryptographic function include RSA, SHA-1, AES, and it's of a size of 20.4 KB. Um, and we compile using FOM code such that it would be smaller. Therefore, we can fit the entire crypto library in just one cache way. Uh, therefore, it is. Uh, and then the next one we, we look at is, hey, um, we are putting everything in cache. Uh, now we need to decrypt code and encrypt code every time it, when it gets called, what's the performance impact? Uh, we analyze it from two aspects. The first aspect we analyze it is from uh, the impact to the application performance itself. Right. Um, on the left side is the diagram for uh, RSA decryption. So as you can see, if we only decrypt one R make one RSA decryption every time we uh, build and tear down the environment, we're making we're having 25% performance overhead. Uh, however, if we do a little bit more decryption with the environment setup and tear down cycle, then the, um, the overhead is almost electrical. For AES, um, if you just give it uh, 
uh, one, 128 byte blocks, uh, 128 bit blocks every time, then the performance overhead is large. However, once it gets to around 50 KB, the, you, you can barely see the performance. So uh, with that, I conclude that it's, it incurs overhead, but it's manageable. So what is the performance? So what is the performance impact on the system itself, right? Uh, we now see the performance impact on the application. The performance impact on the system is uh, shown on the graph. Uh, when we use only one L2 cacheway, it's actually uh, very small, about 3% uh, of the uh, overhead in the worst case where we do random memory reads across the entire memory region. And when we use the entire seven cacheways, uh, we can see that we actually have uh, a slightly worse uh, performance overhead where, where we reach 20-30%. Uh, but, but for the security that we get, I believe it's a reasonable price to pay. So as a conclusion, we propose a secure cache-assisted soft bounded execution that provides confidentiality and integrity to both the uh, code and data of the application, which is uh, what we did uniquely, uh, and we protect against both software level attacks and code uh, memory disclosure attacks. Um, in the future, we'd like to invest, because currently our application build there is still self-contained, how do we support uh, an OS call into an untrusted OS? It's still unchart uncharted and, uh, territory and active research area that we want to look into. And that's all I have. Thank you. Time for one question before we end the session. It's very nice work. This is Yan Lin from Apple. Uh, during our talk, you mentioned that you are going to pause the operating system when you load something into the cache. Can you please provide more details about what you, will, what you are doing when you pause the OS? Uh, is that possible that attacker can use uh, DMA to overwrite the contents in the cache? Thank you. Ah, oh, that's that's a great question. Uh, so uh, we did we we write about that detail in the paper. But uh, when we pause the OS, we basically disable order interrupts. Yes, they can program a uh, uh, DMA capable device to come back and rewrite. And we did verification there to to see that they cannot rewrite our cache. They can rewrite our memory, which is fine but the cache environment is protected. Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, sure, we can discuss more details, thank you. Okay. <laughs>